Jehovah God, our Father, we thank you for bringing Jamie to us safely. We pray that she will feel your love and wisdom in her heart. I hope you pack something nice to wear to the meeting tomorrow. The truth is a huge part of our lives. Besides, you might enjoy it. Please rise. I'm Marika. Do I call you Sister Marika? It sounds weird when you say it. Thank you, Our Father, for this food you've blessed us with this evening. Thank you for choosing us to be your witnesses. Isn't it beautiful? Are you trying to convert me? Not unless you want me to. Do you recognize yourself as a sinner? I do. Have you repented of your sins? I have. <laughs> so you are a Jehovah. Not gonna let me go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we are so excited today to have with us Mark Slutsky and Sarah Watts to talk about their fantastic movie that I saw at Tribeca last year called You Can Live Forever. And guys, this movie is absolutely powerful. How did you come up with wanting to, to make a movie about this particular subject matter? If they're not familiar with it, you, you're more than welcome to fill them in on what the movie is about. Um, well, I grew up in the Jehovah's Witness religion until I was about 13. So, um, it was pretty, it, it's not like fresh in my memory. I'm not, uh, it's been a few decades, but, uh, a lot of my experiences were, were, were very much baked in and I took Mark out for a drink one day about 10 years ago. And we, I told, I told him about my childhood and he was really fascinated by the details and yeah, he, he uh, he he thought we should we should build a story from that and like I've always of course wanted to make a great lesbian film and the two seemed to well married. Yeah, I um, you know, I think a lot of people have heard the Jehovah's Witnesses have some vague idea of them, but aren't really aware of what they're all about. And that was certainly the case for me. Um, I didn't realize how fascinating and sort of intricate. The religion was and how much of you know their own vocabulary um they used and the 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 customs and their their theology was really really fascinating to me i've always been interested in religious topics uh so it just you know talking to sarah uh when she took me out that time it was just like this has to be a movie we need to write this <laughs> um because i i think it really will open um uh, a lot of people's mind to 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 this unique faith. I love that. Uh, can I? I had heard that you were part of the religion in your youth, yeah. uh, Sarah, and I'm glad you went back and you know reminded me that I, I that I knew that fact. Because uh, when I wrote my review for the film last year, I, I thought to myself, only somebody who was in it could really have yeah. the insight into the vocabulary and the the utter idiosyncrasy of everything that happens there because everything is it seems very minute i wanted to ask you about anwen and june your two leads uh -huh. how did you guys go about casting them and uh, because they have magnetic chemistry i said it in my yeah. review they have magnetic chemistry and how did you guys come up with those two did they screen test together what happened there yeah um we had a great uh casting agent jesse griffiths who um had found had found, especially for Marika, so many um, options of, of 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 actors for all the roles. And for Onwen, I had seen Onwen on a TV show, um, and I, there was just something about her that resonated with me. And I had asked Jesse if she would do a tape, and she did. And then, yeah, we did chemistry tests with them, and you know, it was all over Zoom because it was during COVID that we were doing the casting. So they lived on opposite ends of the country. So they weren't even in the same room together until a week before filming. Um, so I just sort of went, you know, 
with my gay gut and and hoped that they <laughs> they would have the energy I thought that they would and they did and it was uh amazing they were amazing together I love that I did not know that one could have a gay gut but now <laughs> we know. do I love it so this is both of your guys's feature debut I know Mark you've done some shorts uh what's that like can you describe what it feels like to be taking this large undertaking and putting it together as a team yeah Mark. yeah i mean uh yes features are you know they're real marathons they take an enormous amount of energy uh in in many ways you know in writing you know it was like you know seven years of writing this movie um mostly because we were trying to raise funding and we kept rewriting it and we trying to just keep making it better and better mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're working, you know, like 16 hour days for, you know, five or six weeks. And, but there, there's something really beautiful about working with people you find really talented, who are on the same wavelength as you, and then just being able to do that every day uh, and really work towards something. And it gets to the point where even if there's problems, we had all sorts of like problems, you'd lose a location or you're, you shoot a scene and realize it just doesn't work and you need to rewrite it that night. But you know, if you're if you really have the right uh, people around you and you know what you want to do, um, there's something about that that's just exhilarating. So it was really exciting, basically. After I, I've done a lot of shorts, I, I love doing them, but I always felt like, you know, it wasn't enough. You know, it was like you know two days of shooting as opposed to 25. Uh, so it was just wonderful <laughs> to finally be able to do that and then to, you know, share it with the world. Um, and, you know, take it everywhere from, you know, Tribeca to Austin to Singapore to Australia um, and feel that it resonated with people. So a long, long, almost decade long process, but uh, one that we're, you know, really, really happy we did. Yeah. And the experience of directing together was just as harmonious as the experience of writing together, which meant a much calmer set than many people that worked on it were used to. Mm -hmm. two of us being able to answer questions and problem solve it really made for a nice vibe yeah, you see a lot more directing duos now and i think it's because if they're in sync it's just so it's easier for everyone on set like you just everyone on set wants the director's time all the time and if you have two people to spread that around like it just makes everyone less stressed out so um you know film is a super collaborative meeting medium and we don't see why that shouldn't apply to the director's chair as well. I love that. And it seems like you guys were, had, were on the same page throughout because you can't make something that is as cohesively directed as this if you guys aren't on the same page. And yeah. a lot of that is, you know, the fact that you guys wrote it and put it to put it from page to, to screen together. Uh, let me ask you a couple of fun And questions. spent so much time writing it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. seven years, you, you pretty much figure out what you want to do, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I was going to ask you if, if 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 when you were writing scenes that came out visually the same way you wanted them to off the page, but I, I'd assume after seven years, you kind of know exactly what you want visually, right? Yeah. But I mean, at the same time, like, uh, if you have that preparation, it gives you the ability to improvise and to, you know, throw, tear up a scene or, you know, the scene in the, uh, when they're walking around the Ciclorama, which is that huge 360 degree painting. Um, that was something we just like sort of saw off the side of the road, you know, made a phone call and, to see if we could rent it and then just completely rewrote that scene um, because we just thought it would be such a great backdrop for it. And I think because we had prepared so much, we were able to improvise on it and, and work on the spot a little bit. And uh, and that's really the joy, I think, yeah. of, of directing. It totally worked. And I, there's a scene, I won't spoil it for people who haven't seen the movie yet, where I expected the other shoe to drop the entire time and then it just didn't. And then later on, when the other shoe does drop, you just feel it right in your heart. You're like, yeah. oh, mm -hmm. God, that's <laughs> great tension. So great job building that in, man. Because that's hard to do, especially Thank for you. me, because I see 300 movies a year. So I'm like, yeah, I know where this is going. And then it didn't happen. <laughs> I, I felt kind of. I don't know. I was blue balls, but like not disappointed in a bad way. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not mad. Yeah, that works. So no, great job, guys. I'm going to ask you a couple of fun questions just because it's more, it's, I always like to ask my, any guests I have a, some fun questions. And the first one is for both, obviously they're both for both of you, but 
the first one is who do you guys look to as inspirations, whether that be in your personal life or in your work as artists, writers, and directors? Um, for well, we both sort of connected on artistic inspirations coming into this project. Of course, we have a very similar taste. Um, you know, we really love the Swedish filmmakers, Lucas Mudison, um, Ryan Anderson. Ryan Anderson. All this, we love all the the Scandinavian filmmakers. Joachim Trier, who did um, Worst Person in the World. Um, we really like. We're thinking a lot about. Uh, Nordic movies when we were making this movie and those really inspired us. Mm. There is a sort of Nordic visual sense to the film too. The way there's a fjord. The there's fjords in it. <laughs> Canada's only fjord. We went there to shoot the fjord. Uh, yeah, we wanted to just to have that that nor that northern feeling uh, and not pretend that we were in any town USA. Mm -hmm. which, uh, a lot of films shot in Canada just try and genericize it, and we were like, let's get as specific as possible. Yeah. Um, I was going to guess Canada. You so actually just... gave it away, guys. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, what about your other inspirations, Sarah? I mean, I, I know there's, um, um, Siama, you know, we love. Yes, yeah, so then Siama. Um, you know, the music that we listened to was a huge inspiration. Music by like Cocteau Twins. Yeah. Uh, music of that era, huge inspiration. Yeah, we listened to tons of music while we were writing it, and then the uh, the composer that we had score the film was it we, we listened to the whole time we were writing it. So we really were all in that headspace already when he started to score it for us. I do love. And the we both love. Yeah, the yeah. Content. We both also love the 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 writing of Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer, and we snuck in one of his books yeah. that Jamie's reading. You don't really see it; you have to really look for it. Yeah. But we try to put a lot of our own obsessions and, and things that we loved in there. Yeah. I love little Easter eggs like that. So thank you for yeah. giving me that insight. I just, I love, I eat that stuff up. So I appreciate you telling me that. <laughs> this next question is the hardest question. And it always requires a little bit of time to think about. If you guys could only pick two films for the rest of your life to watch, what would they be and why? Oh my God. Yeah, see, immediately Sarah's head went, no! You know what? It's very difficult 2001. Okay. And you know, Portrait I was also good. <laughs> that was the first one I reached for. <laughs> Portrait of a Lady on Fire is the other one because I want a little romance. That is very romantic okay. film and a very sexy yeah. film. So great choice. Opposite films. So I yes, was, 2001 was... is not sexy at all. It's the most sterile thing in the world, but it's so good. I mean, it's sort of aesthetically <laughs> sexy, I guess, and if you like that kind of design, which I do. It Mark, is. It is beautiful. Your turn. Okay, so 2001. This, this is a movie I've rewatched since I was a kid, you know, like it's like yeah. one of those ones I keep coming back to and always find something new in. The other is a four and a half hour Argentinian movie called Historias Extraordinarias that I've been obsessed with since I first saw it on a film jury over 10 years ago. Um, this movie, movie is great, yes. <laughs> you know it? I've heard of it. <laughs> it it's so good. I, I recommend everyone check it out if you can somehow find it. Anyways, it's a great movie. It's inspired me a lot, and it's really long, so there's just like a lot of material there for a lifetime of, of watching. Yeah, good call. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't pick like Santanango or something. <laughs> <laughs> then you'd be there forever, and you don't never yeah. have to watch it again. So no, it's funny because you're like the fourth. You're like the two guests. So now I've had three total guests in the last month that have picked 2001 as one of their inspirations. You'll be surprised at who the other person was. Actually, you, a very famous person. Um, his name is, it's uh, Carrie Elwes. Oh yeah! No way! Yeah. <laughs> That's he, amazing. <laughs> I interviewed him two weeks ago, and he picked that film as well for his uh, one of his movies. And I was like, "Wow." That's inconceivable. Uh, well, that's done. awesome. <laughs> uh, he's you know, the funny. truth is, that there's no other movie even remotely like it. No, like it is so no. unique in every way. Um, it still looks good today, and it's 40 years old, almost 50 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I almost love 50 that years old, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I've seen it on everything old. from VHS to 70 millimeter film. And, yeah. You know, it's great every time. How good does it look on 70, on a 70 print? Uh, it looked amazing, but here's the thing. Like, the silence in that movie is so amazing. And there was yeah. a guy sitting next to me who was eating literally at the rate of, like, one piece of popcorn every 10 seconds. And even during the quiet space scenes, I wanted to throttle him. <laughs> I figured after the intermission, I, I, 
<laughs> I figured after the intermission he'd be done, but he came back from the intermission and kept, kept eating his popcorn. <laughs> Oh man, I would have probably thrilled him. I don't have patience for that for ruining an experience for people, other people. It's not cool. No, everyone knows you finish the popcorn by the time the titles go up. I mean, I don't know anyone who could even physically eat that slowly. That's what I'm saying. Like the popcorn's gone by the time the credit, the opening credits are up. You know exactly. what I mean? Not that they do opening that credits be the plan. anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> if if it all goes well, that's according to plan. Now I know. I said I saw this film last year, and so and the thing is. I was able to remember all of it because it stuck with me. I saw it literally almost a year ago back in June yeah. and it stuck with me because it was such a powerful film. It was funny. I, I don't usually look at other people's reviews because I don't like to, I had already written mine when I watched uh, a fellow critic, uh, Chris Stuckman, who used to be in the Jehovah's Witness himself, mm -hmm. do like an hour long video about it. Yeah. And I would not have watched it had I not known that he used to be a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Mm. Did you guys have a chance to check it out? Because it's very, very interesting for somebody who used we to talk be to him. Cruise. We talked to him for about an hour. We had a private Zoom with him because to send him the film, because it was before it was he had no access to it. So we sent him the film, and then we talked together for a long time because he wanted to talk about our sort of shared history. Um, yeah, he was lovely, and he's really done a lot for the film, actually. Yeah, and like I said, it stuck with me. It's a very powerful movie. And what I think is so interesting is your ending is not what I thought it was going to be. And I love that. I, and you didn't go ambiguous because a lot of these films coming out of like Tribeca or South by, they'll go ambiguous with their ending. <laughs> and I hate that. I hate that. You didn't think it was ambiguous? No, you guys left it open to interpretation, but there's very much an ending. There's an yeah. ending to, you know, I won't say what, but there's an ending to something and a beginning to something else. Yeah. That's, there's no ambiguity there. The audience can still take what they want from it, but you've at least told us that there's an ending. This is the ending. Whereas sometimes yeah. a film will just credit rolls and then I'm mad. Yeah, that was that was really something we intended the whole time was to, to really let the viewer, you know, Decide. continue the story in their head. But yeah, we wrote, the, the ending was written right from the get-go. Like it was really, mm -hmm. we had that in mind from the beginning. And I won't spoil it because it, it is gonna. It, it is worth. Uh, people need to check out this film because it's fantastic. Uh, can you tell us when it's coming out and where they can watch it? Uh, it's coming out on Friday on all the digital platforms. So yeah, people can rent or buy it there. And then we're, we're screening at a couple theaters in New York this weekend. We'll be there. Actually, yeah, starting May May fifth, uh, both in theaters and on. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, streaming on demand to rent or buy in Canada and the U.S. And if you're listening in the U.K., uh, it'll be, um, I think, June 19th. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to, to, to know so that people can get access to this movie because I, d I definitely think they should check it out. Uh, you guys need to make sure you check it out because it is one of the best films I saw at Tribeca Film Festival. And it's one of the best films I saw at Outfest, too. And all those films are lgbtq queer films and this is one of the better ones that i saw at that at that particular festival it doesn't beat you over the head with it with its message i thought you guys did a great job of making everything so subtle and non-judgmental of the people still in the truth mm. I, I mentioned that in my review that i didn't think that you i thought you guys did such a great job of not pointing fingers at the jehovah's witness uh lifestyle mm. or looking down on them and I, that's a really hard thing and you guys nailed that. So great job yeah. with that. Thank you. That's so Thank hard you. to do. That's so hard to do with religious themes because oftentimes you're like, these people are bad. No, no. But you guys didn't do that. They're just <laughs> people like the rest of us trying to live their lives the way that they want to. But yeah. their belief system is so diametrically opposed to how these young ladies want to live their life even for this moment. Yeah. That's such a hard thing to do. So great job with that, guys. Um, if anybody wants thank you, to, uh, as intended. thank you. Um, I'm glad that I actually got that right. Sometimes I don't get the themes right <laughs> <laughs> or I misinterpret, but I'm glad that I didn't misinterpret that because it really, no, that's no, what no. really stuck with me. Uh, if people thank wanted you. to hit you up online to let you know how much the film impacted them, how would they do that, guys? Uh, we are on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I think it's YCLF underscore film on both. That's right. Perfect. Guys, make sure you're checking this out for Film Snob Reviews. This has been William. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. 
I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Of course. Yeah.